Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Matt Williams. I'm a tutor and what is known as the Access Fellow here at Jesus College at the University of Oxford. Now, what is the one thing that you must know if you want to get admitted here to study medicine or indeed to study anything at the University of Oxford? Well, I'm not just gonna blurt out and tell you, I'm gonna show you, hopefully. So let's talk through a past Oxford interview question for medical sciences, which is why do we have red blood cells? Why do we have red blood cells? Now, it's a really interesting question, and the temptation is to just unload all of the facts and information that you might have about red blood cells that you've learned from school, such as the fact that they are important for exchanging gases around the body, like oxygen and carbon dioxide. You might also know about their interesting shape, sometimes re re described as a biconcave shape, which looks a little bit like a donut with part of the hole filled in. You might even know some super unusual facts such as there's only one vertebrate known not to have red blood cells, which is the, the crocodile ice fish. <laughs> now, you don't, however, need to know any of those facts. And this is the crucial insight, which is that knowing stuff, knowing facts, it's not particularly helpful in an Oxford interview. And we're not looking for know-it-alls who have this sort of encyclopedic knowledge about red blood cells. We're actually looking for think-it-alls, people who are very good at analyzing problems and using the bits and pieces of knowledge they do have, including bits and pieces of knowledge that we, the interviewers, will provide in order to solve complex and difficult questions such as this. So how might we sort of proceed to unpick this well, good analysis basically means asking good questions. So what we might do in the interview is sort of encourage you to unpack the question, to deconstruct it a little bit. So let's start by just stripping away some of the complexity and saying rather than why do we have red blood cells, let's start with a much broader question. Why do we have cells? Why do large organisms like human beings utilize these little sort of semi-permeable bags within which to conduct the biochemistry that supports our life. And why not, as is the case with some invertebrate species, have this fluid that sort of soaks our organs and tissues and that be the site for you know, the circulation of important gases? You know, why bag it all up in a cell? So that's the sort of the broader perspective. And that will be where you start to think about it because actually, you know, the standard narrative that you may have learnt about red blood cells of doing the job of helping to circulate key gases around our body, it's actually a compound within the cell that's doing that job, it's the haemoglobin. So the cell itself is not, strictly speaking, doing that job, it's facilitating that job. So when asked, why do we have red blood cells? There's a bigger story, there's a bigger picture to look at and the academics in the interview would help you find that. But you just have to be willing to go there, you have to be willing to think a bit more laterally and not just constantly rely on stuff you know. One of the biggest mistakes that students make in an interview is that they're so desperate to show off how much stuff they've learned and can remember that they just bombard us with facts. But actually we're more interested to see how you think and how you untangle this complex problem. So we might start with that bigger picture, why have cells at all, to which one sort of explanation could be, well imagine you're going to the airport and you've got all of your clothes just sort of bundled up in your arms, right? <laughs> and you're trying to sort of get yourself sorted. It would be incredibly inefficient and it would also be quite insecure. You know, you could lose stuff and, and it's just not a great idea. And it's kind of a similar deal with cells, that they are a very useful package for the biochemical processes of the body, which helps keep everything inside relatively secure. But it also is much more efficient than some of those processes happening without the cell. So some long distant ancestor of all vertebrates, except for the crocodile ice fish, presumably, or perhaps <laughs> evolved the red blood cell as both a security and an efficiency mechanism for the transfer of gases. Now that is a sort of slightly more interesting and out of the box answer to this question. But we can go deeper, right? We can then say, well, how would you test your intuitions on this? How would you actually go about and find out if your hypotheses are correct? Let's say one of your hypotheses is that red blood cells improve the efficiency of gas transfer. How would you actually go about testing that? Well, coming up with some sort of laboratory experiment, a randomized controlled trial to test that, it's going to be very difficult and possibly downright unethical if you start sort of bleeding patients or corrupting their red blood cells. 
So some of the techniques that are common to the natural sciences, like randomized control trials, might be difficult, perhaps even impossible. So what we may be left with are comparative analysis. Now, the crucial difference between a sort of comparative observation as opposed to an experimental study is control. In an experimental study, the experimenter has, at least nominally, absolute control. There's a, a treatment group and a control group, and the difference is absolutely controlled by the, by the researcher. But in an observational or comparative study, a degree of control is lost. But you try and nonetheless minimize the differences between the cases, so you are just observing the key difference of interest. So let's say, for example, we're interested to find out why do we have red blood cells. You could find patients who have blood disorders and who are nonetheless very similar to other patients who do not have blood disorders and see what effects are observable. So for example, we might take patients who present with sickle cell and look at their siblings or their neighbors or other people who live in very similar circumstances who do not have sickle cell and try and observe the differences. You may be aware that one of the symptoms of sickle cell is anemia. And so that suggests that one of the things that the cell, the blood cell itself is doing, not the hemoglobin contents, but the blood cell itself is something so crucial to the efficiency of gas exchange that people without it can become very sick very quickly. Another insight could be gleaned from people with blood cancers like leukemia. Uh, so there are various sort of ways we can perform observational studies. Now, it wouldn't be necessary for you to know all of these things and to just come out with it like that. But it would be necessary for you to be able to go on a journey with an academic and think about these things and be ready to, to sort of go beyond what you've covered in school textbooks and go beyond the standard narrative about red blood cells are biconcave and they perform this task of exchanging gases and think more deeply. So the one thing you must know before applying to Oxford for medical sciences or indeed for anything is that you don't need to be a know-it-all. There's not some particular fact that we're waiting for you to recall perfectly. You need to be a think-it-all. You need to be the sort of person that's able to think through and deconstruct these big problems and go with the academics to some places that you won't have ever read about before. I hope that makes sense. Let me know in the comments what you think, and I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.